Um, when we have these people that we find in the evals that are at that marginal borderline and um, you know really any little thing could really tip them over to the other side and we tell them to slow down or whatever and then the, and the follow-up visit they're often common is you know I, I feel lazy I feel guilty you know um, and it's just a whole different it, it impacts not just it just impacts who they are because that's not who they were. You know, they're the ones who would do that extra mile when nobody else would. And now we're telling them, you know, just don't even try it, don't even attempt it. And it just kind of impacts their whole, you know, uh, perception of themselves. And it's, I think that's a very difficult thing for a lot of our, our patients to handle. Though on a, on a logical level, they understand this is what I need to do. And um, in, in our evals, we often try to actually involve the patient's family and so forth. And we tell them, look, three means 15% of normal strength. 100% is normal, you have 15%. And, um, and that seems to make a pretty significant impact on family members. It's like, oh, well, you know, you look so normal, you're walking around doing this stuff, but boy, you're 15%, you know. I think um, what I want to focus on is, is to let the community, the whole polio community and also the, the medical community know the importance of that mu what muscle testing really is. It, it can help risk stratify who's going to be you know, in more in trouble than others. It's going to help in terms of who can exercise, who can't, which limb can be exercised, which can't. Um, and the, and the, just the whole medical community, the muscle testing is sort of became a very cumbersome thing that not many people do, unfortunately. Um, physical therapy, it's therapist does them, but oftentimes it's not incorporated into the physician plan, plan of care. Um, so I think having that import, uh, having that, and also this, the, the concept of, uh, you know, what, what, would, what would cause exacerbation of those codes, you know, how could you basically, uh, you know, do things to prevent it from coming on as quickly or, you know, or prolong your stable function as much as possible. All of our polio patients, they, they're the same but different. There's, uh, there's a lot of psychosocial issues that go along with uh, our polio population, as everyone knows, is a very driven population, uh, type A personalities, as they'll, they'll say. And Treating, treating them, there are similarities and dissimilarities, but the fatigue issue is a very prone thing with regards to our polio population that might be caused differently than uh, in, say, a stroke population where it's just that physical kind of demand that because of the hemiparesis, if, if that's the condition, that it's uh, more fatigue due to the weakness of the muscles. Uh, with post polio syndrome, we see more of a generalized fatigue that might not be indicated by weakness. Uh, so that's a struggle that the patients have, and we have too, and with regards to treating it. So it's the energy conservation and management techniques. And uh, I like to push on patients. It's more, I want you to come out of here doing more of the things that you want to do and less of the things that you feel like you have to do. And we try to give them avenues of how to lessen the things that they feel like they have to do. Uh, whether that's using some different grocery shopping techniques and ordering them online, which we have, and they deliver it to your home, uh, which is inexpensive, but people don't, might not think about that. Whether it's uh, picking out the clothes and getting the laundry set the night before so that in the morning you have less things to do before you're running off and trying to get to work. Letting patients know that it's okay to change their job and to take on less responsibility and that they need, it, they need to preserve their health as we talk about conserve it to preserve it instead of use, use it or lose it. Uh, so it's really it's a change in how they approach their daily routines and the energy conservation and uh, we talk about an energy budget uh, that you only have a certain amount of energy for that week how are you going to budget your energy for that week so that you don't use it up by the middle of the week and this way it could extend throughout the week and you don't have that setback that we see in our polio populations that we might not see in the stroke populations or other uh, injuries. You know, that feeling that you have less muscle fibers that are around and that if you tax the ones that are remaining that you're going to lose them further that's more unique to polio than it is for the stroke population. So I think it's more imperative to let them know you can't just 
exercise, 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 and expect to gain that strength back, and that that could actually be harmful. And when you say that to a patient and they're looking at you and they say, but I want to make it stronger, I love doing my three-mile walks, and I want to continue to do my three-mile walks so I can always do that, we try to get them to step back and say, well, if you keep doing those three-mile walks, but you're not able to do your other daily functions during the day because you're doing that walk, that's a poor choice. So we put that out there when we have patients make choices, and it is their choice. We can give them suggestions and say, well, in all the polio population that we've treated, we know that if we limit the overuse of these muscles that you're going to be better off in the long run. And that's why when you've spoken to the physical therapist, they do have a polio-specific exercise program. It's not a program that says, no, if you have right lower extremity weakness, do not exercise. It's just exercising within parameters. Mm -hmm. So it's us trying to set those parameters, and the therapists have specific parameters that they go by with uh, one repetition max and trying to do non-fatiguing exercises, teaching the patients, well, this is the warning signs. If you're over-fatiguing a muscle, this is what you're going to see. Back away. Definitely continuing with the stretching program because if you don't have the length in those muscles, then that's also going to affect your strength and how effective you can use those muscles. So, yes, it's not a all or none. It's not exercise or don't exercise. It's moderate exercise is going to be the plan, but the three-mile walk might be too much. Doing the stairs and having patients tell us that, well, I go up and down the stairs because that's my exercise that I like to do. And we say, no, that's the wrong exercise. This is the type of exercise you should be doing. So it's more education of how to redirect their focus of their exercise. And if their arms were unlikely affected, then using their arms to get the cardiovascular exercise that's necessary uh, and not using their legs for that cardiovascular exercise. So there is, there's the balance of, well, where are you getting exercise from? What are your goals? And then just educating the patient whether that's an effective goal.